Good afternoon to those of you who are here in person and to everyone watching around the world, particularly those in Europe. I am John Walters, President and CEO of Hudson Institute. On behalf of my colleagues, welcome to Hudson's Betsy and Wally Stern Conference Center. I must begin by offering my condolences to the families and friends and fellow citizens of the victims of the terror attack in Brussels this week, and as we continue to mourn those killed in Israel. From Israel to the United States and across much of Europe, our societies have felt the evil of terrorism, and our sympathies and prayers are with those grieving their loved ones. Today, we look to turn grief into purpose. Hudson Institute was founded in 1961 by a policy innovator, Herman Kahn. He understood the necessity of strong alliance between the United States and Europe. Hudson Institute's Center for Europe and Eurasia, launched a year ago, strives to make that alliance as strong as it can possibly be. It is in that spirit that we welcome President Ursula's, Ursula von der Leyen here today, and we're honored to have her with us. Uh, when General James Mattis, uh, actually President von der Leyen's counterpart in her previous role as Germany's Minister of Defense, when Mattis took command of the 1st Division of the United States Marine Corps, he adopted a motto, no better friend, no worse enemy. At Hudson, we aspire to follow that model in our work. Over six decades, we have sought to advance the American national interests, but we have done so recognizing that promoting a secure, free, and prosperous future for our country is only possible if America takes an active leadership role beyond our shores. That means confronting our enemies and supporting our friends. The truth of 60 years ago is the truth of today. America's alliance system in Europe is essential for the peace and security of the world. In Eastern Europe and the Middle East, our enemies are active and aggressive and dangerous. Russia's barbaric war of aggression continues in Ukraine, while Iran and its proxies create an expanding co conflict in the Middle East. In Beijing, on the sidelines of the third Belt and Road Forum this week, Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping held their 42nd meeting in yet another expression of their No Limits Partnership. Hudson knows the character of these regimes, their anti-Western goals, their anti-democratic goals, and their brutality. We know that these goals are at the heart of their foreign policies. But Hudson also know who, knows whose America's friends are. While President Putin was meeting with Chairman Xi, our guest, President von der Leyen, is here to meet with President Biden. We look forward to hearing her remarks on the on US-EU relationship and what can be done to make the world safer, more prosperous, and secure. Madam President, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Walters, dear John, for the invitation and Thank you for the outstanding job you do here at Hudson. In the, the 20 years since Hudson moved to DC, you have become an incredible authoritative source of ideas and analysis, not only here in Pennsylvania Avenue, but also for us on the other side of the Atlantic. Your positions from the support to Israel, to keeping Ukraine on the path of victory, from artificial intelligence to China, constantly reach European capitals and influence our conversations. Your track record of mapping out unbiased solutions to the world's most complex challenges is in the image of your founders. And I want to start in particular by paying tribute to the late Max Singer. The vision he outlined in his great work history of the future is one that Europe and the United States have been fighting for the last seven decades. It is a vision of a modern world in which democracy and freedom 
security and opportunity, education and wealth, all become universal. The events of the last weeks in the Middle East and of the last years in Eastern Europe epitomize that this fight has never gone away. In fact, it is more acute than ever. What is at stake here dwarfs what is in front of us in these difficult days. We are shaping the history of our future. And I believe Europe and the United States have a duty to mold that future together. There is one old memory that I would like to share with you. It was in 1987, and I lived in West Germany. Back then, it was unthinkable for most people to imagine that the Berlin Wall could fall, but not for a visionary leader like President Reagan. I remember vividly when he came to Berlin and called Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. I remember how much he touched all hearts in Germany. And Reagan never stopped working for exactly that dream. He believed, and I quote, the Atlantic community is the house of democracy. And for him, this meant that we must, and I quote again, shelter democracy from all the winds that blow. Ladies and gentlemen, the winds are not just blowing today. Today, they are gale force. Our democracies are under sustained and systemic attack by those who abhor freedom because it threatens their rule. For more than 600 days now, our friends in Ukraine have been fighting and dying for their freedom against Russian aggression. And now Israel has suffered the worst terrorist attack in its history and the worst mass murder of Jews since the Holocaust. These two crises, however different, call on Europe and America to take a stand and to stand together. Vladimir Putin wants to wipe Ukraine from the map. Hamas, supported by Iran, wants to wipe Israel from the map. Shelter democracies, we must. Because if we don't, the horror will spread. The horror that I witnessed last Friday when I was in Israel, in Kfar Aza, six days before I visited, it was a lively kibbutz with 750 inhabitants. But on October 7th, Hamas came. At 6 a.m. in the morning, I saw burned out houses, a baby seat covered with blood, debris, bullet holes, unexploded grenades. It was a ghost town. There was no limit to the blood Hamas terrorists wanted to spill. They went home by home. They burned people alive. They mutilated children and even babies. And why? Because they were Jews. Because they were living in the state of Israel. And Hamas' explicit goal is to eradicate Jewish life from the Holy Land. These terrorists, supported by their friends in Tehran, will never stop. And so Israel has the right to defend itself in line with humanitarian law. And in the face of this horror, there's only one possible response from democratic nations like us. We stand with Israel. I have visited Israel many times in my life. But this time, I saw a nation shocked to its core. And from the families of the abducted to President Herzog, 
Prime Minister Netanyahu and right across the unity government, they all had the same request. Solidarity and clear words. And this is the least we can do for the people of Israel. As defenders of a free world where hate, terror and anti-Semitism have no place. The Palestinian people are also suffering from Hamas terror. And there is no contradiction in standing in solidarity with Israel and acting on the humanitarian needs of Palestinians. We have tripled our humanitarian support to Palestinians in Gaza, but we are also reviewing all our development aid to Palestinians in view of a very volatile situation on the ground. And we are redoubling our engagement in the region. We have seen the Arab streets fill with rage all across the region, so the risk of a regional spillover is real. And this is exactly what Hamas was hoping to achieve. And this can derail the recent and historic rapprochement between Israel and its Arab neighbors. A normalization of relations could offer peace, prosperity, and integration to a troubled nation, region. And just weeks ago, for instance, we announced, together with our American friends, a new transcontinental corridor that would link Europe to Israel, to Jordan, to Saudi Arabia, the Emirates, and from there to India. A corridor for trade that would help de-risk all our economies, including from our over-dependence on China, but also a corridor for data, a corridor for clean energy, to create good jobs all across the Middle East. It could contribute to both growth and reconciliation between neighbors. This is the other side of the possibilities. The benefits of a stable Middle East are obvious. But there are those who seek more violence because they know the cost of any instability for us. Iran, Hamas patron, only wants to fuel the fire of chaos. Russia, Iran's wartime customer, is watching carefully. Russia and Hamas are alike. As President Zelensky has said, their essence is the same. Both have deliberately sought out innocent civilians, including babies and children, to kill and take hostage. This is a barbaric way to fight. And left unchecked, this contagion has the potential to spread from Europe across the Middle East and to the Indo-Pacific. Western resolve is being tested every day by those searching for any weakness. Any success they gain will inspire more violence aimed at upending the existing order. An order that so many lives on our continents were sacrificed to create it and uphold it. But escalation is not inevitable. And instability can be contained. Dialogue between Israel and its neighbors can and must continue. I've been recently talking to several Arab leaders, including the King of Jordan, the president of the UAE and the president of Egypt. This time of war must also be a time of unrelenting diplomacy. Europe, as the largest foreign investor in many countries across the region, has both leverage and a stake. And the same is true for the United States. It is a shared American and European interest the pursuit of a world where freedom prevails is our common destiny. Which is why it is imperative that we speed up Ukraine's path to victory. 
Ladies and gentlemen, Ukraine will win. But they need the hardware to get the job done, and we must deliver it to save lives, to bring an end to this conflict, to help regenerate Ukraine, whose warriors will be proud defenders inside NATO. But now it's up to us in the West to help make that happen as fast as possible. And I'm proud that Europe and the United States have been leading on this together. Putin has made three major strategic mistakes. First, he was convinced he would take Kyiv in a matter of days. Well, Ukraine's courage showed him otherwise. Second, he expected Europe to be hesitant and undecided. But we were fast, determined, and unwavering. On day two of the war, we imposed wave after wave of sanctions. And up to today, we have 11 pack packages of sanctions. And all this in close cooperation and constant coordination with the United States. We opened our doors for over 4 million Ukrainians fleeing Putin's bombs. And to this day, we provide them with access to education, to health care, social protection, so far, we have supported Ukraine with close to $90 billion, of which $27 billion in military assistance. And like never before in the history of international aid, we have been coordinating our assistance with the United States and other key partners in the G7 to make sure it is complementary and addresses Ukraine's most pressing needs. And we have already started the process required for Ukraine to become a member of the European Union. Putin's third big strategic mistake was to believe that he could blackmail Europe with energy. It's true, before the war, most of our gas supply was delivered by Gazprom. This was a heavy dependence. But then Putin cut 80% of the gas supply applies in eight months only. So we were in a severe energy crisis, but thanks to our friends in the United States and Norway, for example, we were able to diversify, to get rid of our dependency on Russian gas in record time. We saved energy 20% during this winter. So we got our house in order and stood strong and united against Putin. Because of that, we were able to move on. And one thing is clear, that autocrats only understand one language, and that is the language of strength and the language of unity. Ladies and gentlemen, we can never match the sacrifice and the bravery of the Ukrainian people. But we can stand firmly by their side. And that's what we're doing, for as long as it takes. Not only because it is the right thing to do, but because they are fighting for our values and for our strategic security. So we must support Ukraine to make this war unsustainable for Russia. And together we can do this, and we must, because we know how Russia deals with war that it cannot win on the ground. It tries to freeze them, just like it did with Ukraine in 2014. And then it waits for the right moment to launch a new offensive. And here in this room, many voices warned us of this at the time. And now we are living that in reality. Putin is playing the same waiting game, counting on us, diverting our attention and our resources elsewhere, so there can be no room for hesitation or half measures. Now is the time to double down, whether on finance or equipment, to make sure that the cost of the war for Russia keeps rising, 
and to deter those with intent who are watching us to see if our endurance can match theirs. This is why our sanctions are here to stay. And this is why we have broken free for good of our dependency on Russian fossil fuels. Any solution of this conflict must be a lasting one and a just and lasting peace for Ukraine. And for this, Ukraine needs long-term security guarantees. Many of you will be familiar with the concept of deterrence by denial. It is the idea of providing Ukraine with the military equipment it needs to deter Russia and Russian attacks in the future. I am immensely grateful to the United States for your military support to Ukraine. You've given strength to the courage of Ukrainians. And I want Europe to play a central role in ensuring Ukraine's long-term security. For this, we have to step up our defense spending and our industrial base, and we have already started. With the first investment to ramp up our ammunition production capacity, I believe that this work should happen in synergy with the United States, our oldest and strongest ally. Ukraine's Ukraine, dream, Ukraine dreams of being in Europe and in NATO because it knows what it stands for. NATO and the European Union are standing for security, for freedom, for prosperity. President Zelensky once said, and there's one thing above all that motivates Ukrainian soldiers, it is the expectation that one day they and their children will live in a free and prosperous country like ours. So if we want Ukraine to win, if we want Ukraine to rise from the ashes of this war, we must invest in Ukraine's future, starting today. And Europe is already leading the way with more than $50 billion in investment for Ukraine to be spent over the next four years. Europe intends to step up and has been ramping up its assistance to Ukraine. We recognize that the United States support should be one important piece of a global effort. And we are asking other international investors, public and private, to also chip in to give Ukraine the certainty they need to rebuild, to modernize, and to win this war. And this is what we mean when we say that we are with Ukraine for as long as it takes. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to finish where I started. What Europe and the United States are fighting for together is about freedom, and democracy, it is about security and opportunity, not just for those in active war zones, but for our own societies. We have not forgotten that in World War II, democracy won over fascism and autocracy. And this triumph set our foundation for our peace order. And this is not only about the past, but it will also define our future. And that is why I believe it is the right thing for the United States to renew financial and military support to Kyiv. And that is why I believe it is the right thing for Europe to keep its own support up. The people in Ukraine are willing to die for our common values. They have been doing so for over 600 days. Together, we have powered their resistance. And this is the transatlantic partnership at its best. A partnership for freedom, for peace, for prosperity. A partnership for shared values. And to go back to Max Singer, I believe it is once again our duty 
for Europe and the United States to help shape the history of the future. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm looking forward to the question. Thank you. I'm Peter Rao, <clears throat> Senior Fellow and uh, Director of the Center of Europe and Eurasia here at Hudson. And it's my privilege to hold a conversation with uh, President von der Leyen for the remaining 15 minutes of the program. Thank you so much for those powerful remarks and agreeing to this conversation. Uh, as you saw this morning, the White House announced that uh, the President is going to be delivering a primetime address from the Oval Office to the American people, only the second time uh, in his time in office when he will be speaking to the public in that time slot from that august office. And he has chosen as his topic, very much so the two primary points of focus of your address, the war in Ukraine and uh, the conflict in Israel. Uh, to my mind, what uh, the White House, uh, perhaps intentionally or unintentionally, is doing is highlighting the one malign actor that is active in both uh, of those regional conflicts, and that is, of course, Iran. Iran is supplying uh, Hamas, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, Hezbollah. Uh, its weapons are flowing to Russia, which is attacking Ukraine up to the eastern flank of NATO. And so without getting into the particulars of, say, the JCPOA, I think the question uh, I would put to you is whether or not it's time to think about an additional pressure track on Iran as we consider Iran policy in Europe and in the United States. Yes, absolutely. So um, you have just described rightly so uh, the evil role that Iran plays in the background. And indeed, it is equipping Hamas. 93% of the whole equipment of Hamas comes from Ira Iran, without any question. And therefore, it is so important that uh, we sanction Iran, and we have sanctioned Iran, not only companies, but also personalities, um, heavy biting sanctions. But it is very important also to align um, with others what these sanctions are concerned and to be very strict on all the different ways of, and of, of circumvention of sanctions. So we have quite an experience what the circumvention of sanctions is concerned. And you always have to catch up and to close the loopholes or uh, the leakages that you see in the sanctions regime. But um, th that we have to step up is without any question. Well, perhaps I'll just take it then to Russia sanctions, since you've already given me the key words of, of leakage and whether or not the sanctions are sufficient. As you noted in your remarks, you have managed uh, masterfully, I would say, in a way that really gives Geopolitical Commission its name, 11 rounds of sanctions through the European Union. A 12th, as I understand it, is now at least being uh, discussed within, uh, within the European Union. And Ot Makaras this week in European Parliament led a debate on the efficacy of Russia sanctions. Uh, as I read European statements from Brussels, one of the principal aims of those sanctions is to, and I think I have this almost verbatim, uh, attempt to thwart Russia's ability to make war on Ukraine. Are you satisfied with the scope and scale of the sanctions today to be able to achieve that objective? Is it a matter of sanctions enforcement or perhaps additional rounds that are necessary to really accomplish that goal? It is basically both. So um, we are preparing the 12th package, as you were just saying. So additional rounds is one part. Um, the, but what we see, perhaps to, to start a little bit um, before that, we were the largest trading partner to Russia before the war, without any question. So there were huge volumes. And we see that these volumes of uh, trade um, and the amount of trade have decreased by two-thirds. So it's massive, the reduction of trade uh, and thus income for Russia by our sanctions. Um, we also see the signs of an artificial war economy in, in Russia. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you look deeper into it, you see, for example, the, that Russia is constantly cannibalizing other goods to provide, for example, its military um, industry with the necessary high-tech, uh, for example, semiconductors. That is, it is not getting any more because of the sanctions. But there is also the topic of circumvention. We have a special sanctions envoy. We look at all the countries where we see an increase all of a sudden of certain goods, typical sanctions goods, um, going via this country into uh, Russia. And here we are by now very clear to these countries that this will have consequences if this is ongoing. So you see the trade flows. So um, the sanctions are effective. 
The sanctions are biting, they are crippling the Russian economy, but of course Russia is moving also to avoid the effect of these sanctions. So ongoing pressure is necessary. I, I don't think there's any doubt about the sincerity of European support for Ukraine. We heard it from you here again. Uh, Josep Borrell, the High Commissioner this month, led an informal ministerial meeting in Kyiv of the European Union foreign ministers. And uh, dating back to uh, his remarks at the Munich Security Conference in February, he talked about the importance of getting Ukraine assistance in the short term. But he also discussed in the medium term the importance of building up the European industrial base, and you made reference to some purchases here uh, today. How do you think uh, Europe is doing, and this is a debate we're of course having in the United States as well, in building out the European and the American, I guess, industrial base so we can actually achieve those goals which we've set out, so we can really stay with Ukraine for as long as it takes? So first of all, the, the good news is that, unfortunately, because of the Russian war in Ukraine, it needed a war, um, you see that uh, European countries are stepping up in uh, the, the investment in, in defense massively. Think of the 100 billion package of Germany, for example. Towards the 2% and beyond the 2%, so you have uh, also um, a couple of um, European countries that are way beyond the 2% of GDP investment in defense spending. But um, if you look at the overall picture, we also have to see that um, investment in defense decreased drastically after, uh, or there is an underinvestment in defense after uh, the, the wall came down. Mm -hmm. Because we all know the story of the end of history and so on and so forth. Um, this has picked up rapidly now uh, with that uh, new situation. Um, and it is good that we have a, a relatively strong industrial base that is there. It is there. This is good news. Um, it is too fragmented and it is too slow in delivering. So all the focus now has to be, uh, to be more uh, unified and homogeneous in uh, the approach to the um, defense industry and to make sure that it delivers faster. This is the most important at the moment being. We're working on a defense industry strategy now to do exactly that. So the basis is good, but the effect, the delivery has to be better. Uh, around the same time that you codified your last sanctions package, which I think was in June, you also rolled out the multi-annual budget and uh, described the new economic security strategy. Uh, as I read that economic security strategy, I think there are opportunities to collaborate with the United States and potentially tackle some of the challenges you have with China. Could you sketch out for uh, us Americans who might not be read into uh, Brussels strategy making as well as we should be, what that economic security strategy really is and what the guiding thinking behind it is? Yeah, uh, first of all, uh, in general, the economic security strategy looks uh, at, at uh, many countries and our relationship and how uh, the economic relationship is balanced or not balanced. As you mentioned, China, um, it is worrying to see, for example, that we have a trade deficit of 400 billion euros and it's one that has been growing over the last decade. Um, so, first of all, you have to analyze where the, the weaknesses or the risks are under the concept of de-risk, not decouple. Let me first have a look at the risk. A typical example is our dependency on critical raw materials on China. China in the last 20 to 30 years has strategically bought the mines of critical raw materials, takes the product, processes it in China, has basically a monopoly on it. And if you see um, some critical raw materials, the high dependence of the European Union on the Chinese product, it is telling enough. So it is important, um, and that's what we're doing now, that we uh, diversify to other, um, others that are, for example, suppliers of critical raw materials. And what is different is we come with investment to these countries and we tell them, look, it's not that we just want the mining of the product, but we want to invest that the added value uh, the stays locally, and you have the added value in the, in the uh, supply chain locally, while we then, for example, purchase the, the finished product from you. So um, economic security, look at your dependency and change it for the better with other partners. 
Um, we also have, of course, the topic where you have to protect more. This is if you look at high-end technologies where you know that you do not want them to, for example, enhance the buildup of military capabilities. And there, there is then often the discussion at what point, for example, you'd prevent high-end technologies to move out of the European Union and regions where you don't want to see um, them to prol proliferate. Um, but let me also have a look at the topic of not only de-risk, but also um, uh, not decouple. Um, looking at China, it is also, I am deeply convinced, very important to stay in a dialogue with China. We have, for example, topics where we have to work together, and this is, for example, the fight against climate change. Um, China is uh, responsible for 30% of the greenhouse gas emissions. So um, if we want to manage climate change and fight climate change, uh, we have to do it with China. China is uh, seeing the massive effects of climate change uh, on China itself, so the extreme weather phenomenon, the drought, the floodings, and so on. So also has an interest to work here with us, for example, to learn about emission trading systems, how to put a price on carbon. Um, so, uh, so you think the Chinese might be interested in cooperating on? Uh, they on are already co uh, they are already cooperating on mm -hmm. uh, um, how to use in a smart way put in place mechanism and systems that you can reduce the greenhouse gas emissions. And this is the emission trading system, for example. Or you call it uh, carbon tax or, yeah, yeah, carbon tax, basically. So de-risk, yes. Economic security, yes. But not decouple. Well, you gave us the de-risking phrase, and it's now become a part of the American political lexicon. I suppose, just as my own editorial comment, I think the one trouble we've had on trying to forge cooperative agreements with the Chinese on, say, topics that are regularly discussed, like public health there in the COVID crisis, their record was rather poor. On climate change, the number of coal-fired uh, coal power plants, rather, that are being built far surpasses the rest of the world. But I take your point about the importance of trying to forge agreements there. Uh, in the back, we have a press pool, Madam President. And they're here because they want you to make, move, want you to make news. And so um, I have to ask you, as a final question before you go, and you can spill all the secrets here, um, as you're preparing for your meeting with the president tomorrow, what do you anticipate uh, the meeting being like? What can you tell us? Uh, uh, take us into the Oval Office. <laughs> give us a little sneak peek preview of the summit. Um, of course, uh, the main topics will be the two topics I just addressed uh, here in my speech. So uh, the focus will be very strong on uh, the Middle East and on Ukraine. Um, and uh, the rest we will see, but uh, I, this, this is the, the, the core of the debate that we will have in the Oval Office tomorrow. All right, well, if I could ask everyone just to stay seated for a moment at the end as, uh, as the President exits the stage, I would appreciate it. But with that, Madam President, President of the European Commission, a great honor to have you here. Thank you so much for your Thank you very much. Thank you.